Welcome to Sir Henry Fraser, His Life in Focus. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for joining us. Sir Henry concluded our last program describing his experiences as a research fellow at the Postgraduate Medical School at Hammersmith. As promised, he continues to recount his trip to Gambia to conduct research. I flew down to Gambia with all of the equipment I needed, the drugs that I was going to use to test, and my paints. I mentioned my paints. I arrived in Gambia and I was met by the head of the Medical Research Council Laboratory in Gambia because Gambia is an English colony, was a British colony, and in that colony they had established a research laboratory and a research centre looking at malaria and trying to find a vaccine for malaria because malaria is in, endemic in Africa it makes the lives of many people miserable. It kills many people. It's a horrendous disease. People with sickle cell disease, because of the sickling of the red cells in the blood, they're actually protected from malaria to some extent because when the malarial organism gets into those cells, it destroys those cells and with it the organism. So there's a preferential uh, survival factor for people with sickle cell disease in a country with malaria. Anyway, Dr. Ian McGregor, my host, he was working on the malaria vaccine and that was the 1970s. So just think, between that period of the 1970s and today is almost 50 years and it's only this year that the malaria vaccine appears to have become a reality. It's now a very hot topic in medicine, the production of this malaria vaccine. And it's been going on for more than 50 years. Anyway, I went up to Gambia and Dr. McGregor hosted me in a village called Keneba. Now, Gambia is an interesting country. In the era of the slave trade, when African chieftains and tribal leaders were capturing their fellow man and selling them first to the Portuguese and then the Spanish, and then the Dutch, and then the English. They were capturing people all over West Africa and taking them to the coast and selling their friends, their family, their tribal people to all of these European countries for shipping across the Atlantic. And the British, with the connivance of people in Africa, created a colony within a French colony Senegal is the big French colony on the most western part of West Africa. And there's a river running through it called the Gambia River. And the British somehow were able to negotiate with the French and with the African people and to create this colony called Gambia, which was 25 miles wide at its widest and 230 miles long because it was the River Gambia and the River Gambia's banks. And it was created by the British in connivance with the French and the African people in order to make transportation of the slaves from the interior of West Africa down to the coast at Banjul. And so it's an astonishing country. Where the Medical Research Council Centre was established was up country. And that's where I spent 10 days doing my research. But I went into Banjul and I walked around Banjul. And I have to tell you that when I got off the plane in Gambia, which is on the same parallel as Barbados, 13 degrees north of the equator, the man who came to meet me from the laboratory, I said, are you from Barbados? He just looked like a Barbadian friend of mine. He was a spitting image. And wherever I went in Banjul, up country, in the city, everybody just looked like Barbadians. No, <laughs> it was so astonishing to feel that I was in Africa, but I was at home. The temperature was the same, 90 degrees, whatever, 80, whatever, 30 degrees. But the people just looked so Barbadian. It was an astonishing revelation, and it really gave me a bond with Gambia that I've always retained. When I was a small boy, I had a pen pal in Gambia, and he sent me the main Gambian export back in the 1950s, ground nuts or peanuts. I got this wonderful package of peanuts from Gambia. 
But my research took me to Gambia, took me back to Britain, of course, and I worked away in the lab doing all this stuff, and I had a wonderful experience. So Colin was very helpful in making me a global and all-round clinical pharmacologist. He pointed out that when I went home, I would be faced with a financial difficulty of getting access to the best drugs at the lowest cost and being able to make assessments of drugs. So among the things that we did as trainees, but for me especially, he made me a member of the hospital's drug and therapeutics committee so that I could engage in the evaluation of drugs, the comparison of drugs, the selection and purchase and use of drugs. And so this became one of my many themes in clinical pharmacology, the use of drugs. One of the very valuable aspects of my work at Hammersmith was the fact that Sir Colin Dollery recognized that in coming back to the Caribbean, I would have a major problem, all of us would have a problem, in getting the best drugs at affordable prices. And so he put me onto the hospital's Drug and Therapeutics Committee, which allowed me to take part in drug selection, drug choices, comparing drugs, choosing the best one or the best that was most available and most, uh, if you like, economical to buy, because this was going to become a very big thing in the Caribbean. And he also introduced me to a wonderful man who again became a bit of a mentor and a very close friend, Professor Ranjit Chowdhury, who worked with WHO and a lot of my subsequent work with WHO was working with Ranjit across the world. So this was one of the valuable things that I got out of my work at Hammersmith in addition to my own personal research. Another thing that I did was my interest in epilepsy and drug monitoring. When I was at the Institute of Neurology where we saw a lot of very difficult epileptic patients there were one or two new drugs in epilepsy which people were beginning to understand how to use. And this was a fascinating issue. People didn't know a lot about those drugs. But the technology, and technology advances medicine in remarkable ways. The technology allowed people to begin to measure the drugs and the level of the drug in the body. And I was fascinated by that. And at Hammersmith Hospital, obviously, it was a general hospital, there were patients with epilepsy. and so. So Colin Dollery, because of the technology that I was using, he put me in charge of measuring the drug levels in blood samples of patients with epilepsy, and also drug levels in patients with digoxin, a very famous and important drug for heart disease, and drugs for asthma, like theophylline. So I set up personally the first therapeutic drug monitoring lab in, at my workbench at Hammersmith Hospital and one of the very earliest ones in Britain. And that gave me a tremendous advantage so that I could do the same thing when I came home. And all of these areas of drugs and therapeutic management were hugely important. So my, my almost three years at Hammersmith not only provided me with the research skills, the research training that I could then train others in research, but it provided me with a very broad range of tasks that a clinical pharmacologist could do to improve medical and drug treatment. It was a tremendously rich experience. The Institute of Neurology was also a rich experience because I had the opportunity of working with those professors and of working with the very first CAT scanner put into clinical use in Britain. The CAT scan was developed in the early 1970s and when I went to work at the Institute of Neurology in 1973, they had just installed the first CAT scan there. And of course, they were emphasizing its use in the brain and in brain diseases. So there wasn't a week that I was not with the radiologists looking at the pictures on that very first CAT scan where they were making history. That was tremendous. And then I went over to Hammersmith Hospital and did the same thing, making history with therapeutic drug monitoring. Another area that Colin got me involved in was looking at the compliance with medication. The term compliance suggests that the doctor says take this and the patient takes it or doesn't take it. If he takes it, he's compliant. If he doesn't take it, he's not compliant. Now, I mean, he may have very good reasons for not taking it, 
it may produce side effects or he may be afraid of it or he may be one of those people who says I'm not taking medicines I'm only using plants I'm only using natural so that was an area also that I studied subsequently in Barbados a very very rich time at Hammersmith and then I had to wait on completing my thesis I had to wait for an examination what they called a PhD viva and that ended up taking months so what was I going to do meanwhile well, my wife and I had gone to evening classes in the arts. My wife loved to learn making jewelry, so she made some beautiful earrings and things like that in her jewelry class, while I went to an art class, and I had magnificent tutors, both of whom were watercolorists. Now, I have always been a watercolorist for two reasons. One, watercolor paints are much cheaper than oil paints, and two, you can paint a watercolor quite quickly, whereas an oil painting takes a very long time. When, <laughs> when I was in Jamaica, I painted quite a lot, and I also painted in oils, and there was a great occasion in Jamaica when I entered some work, both a painting and a drawing, in the Jamaican National Art Exhibition which is held every year in Jamaica and all the big professional artists take place as well as all of the art students at the now Edna Manley School of Art. So I entered a painting and my painting was called Waiting and it was a pun on the waiting because it looked like a waiting room with a group of patients sitting in chairs in serried ranks but at the front was one of my medical colleagues, Anne, who was hugely pregnant so she was waiting, she was expecting, and she was waiting. And that was a lovely big painting like this, and it won an award, beating out the students from the Edna Manley School of Art. Here's this amateur who paints in his spare time on weekends, and he won this award, and the painting was bought, and it was sent to Lebanon as a wedding gift, and a, a copy was commissioned by my wonderful friends, Joss and Professor Leo Reini of the university, and I painted another version, and they asked me, make it a bit bigger. But it was the same theme painted twice and it still hangs in their dining room. But in London, I painted. So when I completed my PhD, what was I going to do? I took a collection of my paintings and I thought, I'm going to have an exhibition. And I went down the road with all of the art galleries, the King's Road in London, where the art galleries are cheek by jowl. And the first two galleries I went in, they almost laughed me out of the shop because there were no oils in my collection. There were oil galleries, there were big painting galleries and so on. The third gallery I went into was run by a charming Scotsman. And Mr. Stewart said to me, I love your work. I really like your work. And you're in luck. He said, my artist for August, the first three weeks in August, was cancelled. I've got an empty spot and I don't know how to fill it. I've been worried all day. She cancelled this morning and you've come in at just the right time. I'll give you a show. So I put together a show. I exhibited 30 paintings. He said to me, I like the one portrait you have. Could you do a couple more portraits? So I went home and the next weekend I painted Maureen several times. And I did several pictures of Maureen who at that time was eight months pregnant. And so I did portrait, I did full body, I did all of this work, took it up, and he said, I love this stuff. So the week after our son Rob was born, I had my exhibition. Rob was born on July the 15th. My exhibition was held, was opened on the very last day of July. So Rob was a little baby in a little baby bassinet, as they called it at the gallery. He attended an art gallery exhibition at a younger age than most people. And the exhibition was a fantastic success. It was reviewed in a couple of the London papers. A Jamaican critic went to see it and it was reviewed in the Jamaican pa papers. And the uh, owner of the gallery said, I had sold a greater percentage of my paintings than any other artist for that year. I sold 16 of the 30 paintings, which is just over half. Most of the others are around our living room right now. Of course, in those days, you didn't earn much. 
So having paid for the framing, having paid the gallery rent, having paid for the invitation cards, I think I made a profit of £100. And that £100 went towards relocating at the end of our London stay and going back to Jamaica. But it was a great time in Britain because that helped to kill the time. I then did a job in rheumatology and that was extremely valuable. I got a registrar job at a wonderful hospital in rheumatology working with a very knowledgeable consultant. And I'd never been very interested in rheumatology. Rheumatology is derived from the word rheumatism, an old fashioned term for joint pains. And so it is all of the conditions, mostly autoimmune conditions like lupus, of which we hear a lot in Barbados, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and a number of other autoimmune conditions. So I had a wonderful experience in this six month job waiting for my viva. And that served me in good stead because when we came back to Barbados, there was no neurologist, there was no rheumatologist, there was no geriatrician, there was no metabolic expert. All of these things I had acquired in London and it was tremendous to be able to fill gaps until other people appeared. And so one of our bright, honest students, Dr. Cindy Flower, she was encouraged, she liked the rheumatology idea, <laughs> And she went off and she did uh, rheumatology and she came back and she is doing a fantastic job as a modern rheumatologist. So that was one of the great advantages of my extra time in London. I finally had the Viva and that was great fun. I had a two hour Viva and one of the questions that I was asked by one of the examiners, he said, um, how come you have so many papers published uh, in this short time? And I had to explain, well, this is what they do at Hammersmith Hospital. You do the work, you write the paper, and you submit it as quickly as you can so that your work gets priority against somebody else's work in another hospital, especially the people across the pond in the US of A, because there's great competition in medical research between Britain and Europe and the Americas, because the Americas have a great deal of money. I think I may have told the story um, of doing research in Britain and doing research in America. In Britain, they meet around the table, all the people, and they drink cups of tea, and they talk and they plan. And in America, um, one guy sits down and writes a proposal, sends it to the NIH, and he gets half a million dollars six, months late, six weeks later. In Britain, they argue at the end of six weeks, who's going to pay for all that tea? It's a whole different ball game. The, the very frugal approach to financing research in Britain. But I, I, I learned so much in that experience. My wife now, she had a wonderful experience because having come top in dermatology, having won the prize, the distinction in her class of 20 odd people doing this diploma in dermatology, she went on to be offered a wonderful job as a registrar at the Institute. And she was doing something called immunofluorescence because some skin lesions, because of the, should I say, the um, pathology of those skin lesions, the actual cells of certain lesions fluoresce. And that fluorescence as a result of a special staining of the biopsy that you take out of the skin allows you to diagnose X as opposed to Y. So she was doing original research with her bosses at the Institute and published several papers on immunofluorescence in some of these diseases. One of the stories that she likes to tell is that because the Institute of Dermatology was developed from the Hospital for Venereal Diseases, now, in venereal diseases, a lot of them have dermatological manifestations, especially something like syphilis, the well-known scourge of so many people in the world, which was said uh, by the Europeans to have come from North America as part of the transatlantic exchange of diseases. So the Hospital for Venereal Diseases was established very, very close to Leicester Square in London because the area of Leicester Square and Soho, you wouldn't know this, of course, but that is the area where all the prostitutes hang out. That is the area where, uh, when we arrived in London and walked down Soho, it was where all the strip clubs were. And just along the street, just out of this central area, was the institute, the hospital, the small clinical area 
a building of four stories with a roof over the entrance. And of course, in Britain, you know, it rains all the time. So when my wife would be waiting for me to pick her up in the car and she was standing by the entrance under this roof, the professor came down one day after she'd done this a few times and said, Maureen, do not stand there. People will think that you are a lady of the night. <laughs> so she, did, she was very careful to stand inside of the doorway and not outside of the doorway under the roof for me to pick her up. <clears throat> So we had this fantastic experience in London. We learned an enormous amount. It was opportunity, 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 and we took advantage of them all. And we went back to Jamaica after exactly four years with an addition to the family. And we decided the best way to do this was not to fly, but to take a ship. Because if you take, take a ship, you could then take your car with you and you could take your books with you. By this time, our possessions were very limited. Uh, a cot for Rob, a car, uh, lots of books, and the paintings that I hadn't sold in my exhibition. So we created it all up, and we got on a Norwegian ship, which was known as a banana boat. And this was a trip that many people made when they discovered what the banana boats did. Because they had room on the top decks and the level below, they had room for 12 passengers and they were literally labeled as first class passengers. Now, Rob was not a registered passenger. He was an infant, just six months old, and so he would have been number 13. So his name didn't even appear, I don't think, on the ship's log. <clears throat> he was unlucky number 13. <laughs> so it was fascinating going on a ship where you were a first class passenger. The facilities for a kid were not great, but we had what we needed for him. We had our own uh, Dramamine, which was the seasick tablet to prevent us from being seasick in rough seas. And we went onto the ship from Southampton. On the first night, we sailed down the English Channel and it was glorious. We sat down to dinner and we had a three course dinner, which was absolutely magnificent. And the dinner was accompanied by three wines. You had a wine with your appetizer, which was a, a dry sort of sherry-like wine. And then you had a rich, full-bodied red wine with your steak. And then you had a slightly sweeter dessert wine with your dessert. It was an amazing kind of ship with 10 days of first-class cuisine, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The only odd thing was it that the chef was Norwegian. And in Norway, apparently, they eat raw beef as a very special treat. So they would serve up a slice of toast with a, like a raw beef patty on the toast. And that was one of the things that they liked and the, the, the guests didn't. But the first night out, there was a very pleasant Jamaican gentleman who was returning after a life in Britain. He had gone to Britain. He had never been well educated. And he had gone from a farm in the country of Jamaica and he had worked as a manual labor all his life. He was leaving a couple of children back in Britain. He didn't have a wife and he was returning because it was his ambition at 60 to retire and return to his home village. So we chatted with him. We discovered his name and so on. We found out where he was going. I knew the area of Brownstown that he was going to. And the next morning, he didn't appear at breakfast. <clears throat> and we thought, well, he must be sleeping late. And then he didn't appear at lunch. <laughs> so more than I decided that this required investigation. So I went to the captain and I found out where his cabin was. And Dr. Fraser goes down and knocks on his door. And after a long pause, I hear this agonized response. And finally, he gets up and unlocks his door and I go inside and he's collapsed back on his bed and he's prostrate and there's a bowl of some kind by his bed and he says, he says, Doc, I've been so sick, I've been sick, sick, sick. He had been vomiting all night and all morning from the rough passage. We had taken our Dramamine, so we had no problem. So I was able to run upstairs and bring him some Dramamine and he was cured. He was down at dinner, eternally grateful. But in his cabin, his luggage comprised a small suitcase 
and well wrapped up in brown paper, a hoe, a fork, a spade, a machete, all of the tools that he wanted to go back to his acre of land to be a farmer in his retirement. It was, it was a lovely story. Anyway, we arrived back in Jamaica on the 18th of January. That number 18 is important because we finally came to Barbados seven months later on the 18th of September. But on the 18th of January, we sailed into Kingston Harbour and we were returning to Jamaica as a couple with a son, Rob. We were welcomed warmly by Maureen's great friends, the dermatologist, Dr. Shim, and her husband, my friend, Dr. Young, the pathologist. And we spent the first few days living with them in their lovely home, eating their wonderful food, because Norma was a great cook of Chinese food. They were Chinese Jamaicans. And so we had a wonderful time with them for several days. And we were given the keys to the house that the university was going to put us in. And this was on the college close. Now, let me explain about university housing. When the university was established in 1948, the housing that they built for the small number of faculty were generous houses, nicely proportioned, three bedrooms, a study, living rooms, kitchen, veranda on an acre of land opposite the university on the Long Mountain. When Sir Arthur Lewis became Vice-Chancellor, he's an economist, and so he looked at the remaining sites in 1960 that had not yet been developed. And he said, this is nonsense. Why would people need an acre of land? We're going to divide these houses up. And those acre sites were divided into like three, so that each site was about a third of an acre. And the house that we were given had a long entrance driveway a small plot at the end and a house on the corner and the house on the corner the master bedroom with the with the with the bathroom was five feet away from the track that led from the village down below to the village up above in the Warika hills so this first night we slept in this house no drapes or anything the first night we woke up at about two o'clock after a couple of hours of deep sleep, we woke with people chatting outside of our bedroom window. And next morning when I went out to explain why we couldn't sleep because of all this chatting, we saw this path which was traversed by large numbers of people five feet from the bedroom window. So we went into town the next day. We went to the nearest mall. We tried to buy drapes. We tried to buy fittings for the window. There was nothing. And the house, I have to tell you, was absolutely bare. No one had lived in that house for several years. The last occupant had been Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. And no one else would live in this house because it was so horrible. <laughs> so we protested. We only spent two nights there. They gave us another house in Hope Pastures, which was a little better. But what was Jamaica like upon Sir Henry's return on the 18th of January, 1977? Well, we invite you to join us next week as Sir Henry continues to regale us with this tale and more. Until then, I'm Miles Eversley. Do take care and thanks for your time.